So this is um, TR SLAF seminar for October the 1st. And I'm, my name is John Bowman, and I'm a member of the Food Safety Centre in TR. And I'm going to give a seminar on omics and food safety, and I put quality in brackets because it's pretty much, I don't think we can distinguish either these days. I think they go hand in hand together in one way or the other, fundamentally. So in this seminar, I'm going to basically talk about some of the work that we're doing um, at the Food Safety Centre in terms of research and this concept of omics I'm going to introduce for those who are not familiar with it, though I suspect majority of the audience probably is, in terms of what we essentially technology that we are using to try and solve problems and answer questions and basically doing um, research in the modern era effectively. Okay, so farm to fork. So we know that food safety is integral to the for food quality and the food supply chain. So we know that it's a, in order for people to be sure about what they're consuming, they basically usually do things or have their food and prepared in various ways if they're buying it that is safe, essentially. So and I think that's just a natural part of life. Um, that's why I put that, let thy food be thy medicine and, and thy medicine be thy food. Because, of course, if your food contains listeria, monocytogenes, or some other pathogen, it's probably not a, a medicine anymore. So one of the things I like about the food supply chain is that, you know, you don't think about production, but it's, of course, there's so much more to it than just production. You know, we have farms and we produce food, but they have, there's all these things that happen after the farm gate. And I think that's where the Food Safety Centre sort of shines a bit more. It sort of looks at this concept that food is coming through this complex series of steps and it depends on what type of food you're talking about and how it's mixed together and, and of course there's all sorts of issues and problems with that. Even though we might focus primarily on certain aspects of food safety in our particular group, mainly microbial food safety as opposed to all the other possible problems that can happen, you know, there's, there's a lot more to, to this concept of um, food quality and efficient supply well beyond the microbiological aspects. So you have all this wastage, for example. I mean, it's a huge problem. And a lot of that is due to microbes spoiling the food. Okay. So let's look at Tasmanian food production sector values. So this basically sort of defines in a way what food is important um, in Tasmania and what we're probably mainly concerned with, you know, the most likely sources of food or commodities that we do research on. So if you have a look, you can see these pie charts from 2010 and 2011. That's the most recent data I can find on the internet. Um, and also put retail values there to give you a perspective on basically what people buy. But if you have a look, essentially the main pre-farm gate commodities are salmon, dairy, beef, abalone and potatoes, about 75% of the total. So it's around about, about a, a bit over a billion dollars worth of output. And the, after the farm gate, we have some sort of value adding because of the processing. You have salmon, dairy, confectionery, beer, potatoes, beef, and bakery, which is interesting. That confectionery and beer is such a substantial amount of money it's generated. So, so they're, product, they're products which are completely dependent on agri-sector input. So, and they may not necessarily be things that are produced in a state. Like a lot of the malt that's used for beer is coming from outside the state, for example. So obviously with that, you have concerns about the product quality and safety and all those sorts of things come into the picture. So what is omics? This is where we talk about our research and the sort of tools that we're using to actually try to understand the various aspects of, for example, um, food and the microbes, which is what we're interested in because we're microbiologists, um, are involved in food. And we can ask a whole series of different questions using these sort of tools, because that's what they are. Omics is basically a bunch of methods that are used to define essentially things like genomes, transcriptomes, proteomes, and metabolomes. So genomes is basically the information, transcriptomes is a gene expression, so what are the genes are doing? Proteomes. Uh, the proteins, so what makes the actual gene, what makes the cells work, and the metabolites is the consequences. And so you have all these different methods put together to try and answer questions where we might ask things about food safety, we might look at food quality, 
You might be interested in innovation, for example, in terms of how we might, for example, develop better the, foods, the food sector from a certain points of view. I mean, this is just certain specific points of view. So we tend to think in terms of microbiology often with these methods, but you can talk about animals as well. Now, there's some limiting paradigms that we're in, would sort of come into the picture in terms of omics, and it's a relatively new set of technologies that's only appeared in the 21st century. It's only relatively recently that we have access to these tools that can generate all this data, and it's like a deluge of information that's happening at the moment. So, for example, you can be a farmer and you can generate data and more data and more data, and of course, what do you do with it? You know, then you've got have, you've got to have com higher computer scientists and people who do software programming and all that sort of thing in order to be able to handle it. And then you've got people who are looking for interesting nuggets of information amongst all this data, of course, maybe not necessarily knowing what they're looking for. This is one of the problems with having so much data. And then, of course, publishing what stuff that you think is cool but not really understanding what it means. And so how do you actually translate all that to something that's useful, practical, so when we think about food production, we think about the practical. So, and this is a challenge, I, I find, a, a big challenge. It's all very good to get wrapped up in the interesting aspects, the academic aspects of this sort of area, genomics and all that sort of thing. But we sort of have to sort of take it beyond this level. There's a number of other paradigms which I found. There was one called the jailer, which is where they just lock information away and keep it to themselves against their chest or the other one called the, the hermit, where you're basically doing everything by yourself, and I think I can be accused of that sometimes, but anyway. Anyway, omics and applications in agriculture do occur, but of course we're still on the developmental stage, and I've just listed some possible ones here, and some of the things we are doing in our research. So we've got lots of plant and animal genotyping, like genomic selection traits, screening, micro-assisted back-crossing, so you talk about your plant breeding, for example, parentage, GMO characterization, which of course is a bit sort of um, unlike to happen in Tasmania because we have a moratorium against GMOs, but anyway, that's what they're doing outside of Tasmania. We of course have microbial, um, like we're interested in community structure analysis. Now, we tend to, this seems to be more of an area on the microbial side because of course we have microbes being small and complex communities and you, know, you can't actually see them, but there's a whole lot there and they're all sort of different. We, have, we do a lot of community structure analysis since we're trying to access this part of the world, so to speak. And this is the way that we do it, essentially, using essentially DNA technology and so forth. And, for, and you can also go to the systems biology area, so genome sequences, RNA sequencing, high throughput tandem mass spectrometry for proteomics, which is essentially analytical chemistry, more analytical chemistry in the form of metabolomics, and this is an area that we're trying to grow in the university with the CSL. Um, and that again goes into natural products and fluxomic metabolic models, a whole lot of areas. And once you get a lot of this information, you can actually make something of it, I think. And that's where it starts becoming useful. But it's a certain process before you can get there. It's like you have to know a lot of stuff before you can actually really understand it, like to actually apply it. In some cases, you can use... With you know, fairly direct methods, like once you know what you're looking for, like in traceability and provenance. So basically in that particular area, it's like finding things in products. Like say, for example, you want to know that your cheese from Tasmania is the real, is actually what they sell in China, but not actually made in Mongolia instead of Tasmania. They just put a different label on it. Then you, theoretically, you can tell that by using some sort of omics technology um, because it has a particular characteristic sort of chemical structure or microbial community or whatever it might be. Um, but you have to know what you're looking for. You actually have to have developed a lot of knowledge. And I think that's where we're actually in that process. Now, I think in the food safety area, we're well positioned to actually use omics, for example, for strategic science, like food production systems, supply chain analysis for food safety itself, risk assessment. Perhaps, well, maybe some, some aspects of risk assessment can be informed by this type of information. Foodborne pathogens, understanding what they do and how they behave, and spoilage, of course. So I mentioned about the wastage. Of course, if you know how to control spoilage, you might be able to reduce wastage, perhaps, in the long run, anyway. 
And so the idea is that we would like to assist local and national industries and provide data that can be used by people around the world that might be useful in the long run. That's what we hope anyway. Okay. Whoops. So what we're doing in terms of relation to omics, we use systems biology, though a sort of a, a simple version of systems biology. I don't think we use what we call the hardcore systems biology. Systems biologists are very quantitative, as it turns out. So everything has to be quantitative. But the problem is the technology has only just evolved in certain areas to be quantitative, like proteomics, for example, which is really the high-end proteomics, which we don't really have at the moment, unfortunately. We need, you need instruments to be able to do this, and you need expertise. The instruments are worth a million dollars. We now we have an NMR, and I'll talk a bit about NMR later in the in the lecture, in the in the seminar. Um, nuclear magnetic resonance instrument, which is high resolution, that we get got, we spend 1.6 million dollars um, in the university to obtain, so we could do metabolomics. So that's measuring chemicals and metabolites, and so that is just something we're just using right now. So it's a lot of investment, but hopefully it will pay dividends in the long run once we actually know what sort of data we can get out of it. Of course, we, can, we have lots of other things here, like, for example, using clever approaches to try and develop things for food safety. So I mentioned antimicrobial intervention development there, which I'll talk about later. Microbial community structure and characterization in various sectors for, for different commodities like meat, seafood, barley malt, etc., for looking at production systems, and also using it to understand things like probiotic survival, so functional food additives and so forth. So there's lots and lots of possible applications that we, can, that we have looked at or dabbled in to varying degrees. I'll just give three examples in this seminar of this work. So I'll talk about barley and malt, which is work I did with um, Cargill. This is Mandeep Clark, unfortunately he's not here. He did a postdoc on this, um, the previous postdoc before a meat in, um, manifestation, incarnation I should say. Now I'll talk about uh, developing antimicrobial interventions against E. coli and red meat carcasses. That's what Jay Kotaranchit and Bianca is doing. Bianca sitting over there. And then I'll talk about salmon, which is something I'm doing with various people, like Cameron Sakasi, one of our PhD students. So I'll just talk about the barley and malt. I think this is a nice example of application-based omics, essentially. So, I mean, barley malt's not something, we don't mainly make barley malt in Tasmania, we get it imported. It's mainly grown in Victoria, New South Wales, South Australia, and Western Australia. Um, but obviously you can see by the amount of money that we make from beer, which is $300 million, it's a significant industry. So the concern isn't so much about safety with barley malt, it's more about quality. So the safety is generally taken care of the fact that mycotoxins, which are a problem that you would get from contamination of barley malt, doesn't really happen in Australia very much. It's more of a concern in wetter countries. We have wet sort of harvests of barley, like we'd say we'd get in, say, Canada or, the, or Europe. It's more the quality problem because you're looking at subtle things like flavour. And so the, the problems tend to happen after the farm gate rather than before, at least in terms of the, the actual final product. So you have this long, you've got this supply chain, and the problems that we're interested in, we're in this sort of side of the things, in malting. So it's a dynamic ecosystem in the malting process. You go through all these different steps. So you go barling, steeping, green malt, where it's germinating, it ferments, and then it's heated up, and that kills quite a lot of the microbes. As you can see, the microbes grow, and then they drop away because they're being heat treated. But of course, in this process, is where you get your flavours in your in your beer. So it's a, a classic fermentation. But something sometimes it goes wrong, and you don't get what you want. The final product isn't what you want. So it's what they call out of specification, and so it sort of goes out of control. And this is a common problem. So, though you would think that they'd be pretty good at doing it, it doesn't work all the time. So, and the only way to, to try and to to avoid wasting lots of money is to try and catch it before it happens. So we have to try and develop tests to try to catch these problems. So there are various negative and positive effects to do with um, beer manufacture, which is what we're looking at. Um, 
plant diseases for barley, inhibition of grain germination might occur, various reasons. But the main problem we're looking at is, is metabolites that are formed by the microbes. So in this case, we're looking at this problem called premature yeast flocculation, which disturbs the fermentation process and results in weird tastes in the beer. You also get other problems like gushing, and which is an interesting phenomenon. I think it's like when the beer comes exploding out of the bottle or something like that, which is, must be quite amusing. I don't normally drink beer, so I haven't seen it happen. But then you've got other things like toxins and allergens and so forth, but they're not so much of a problem. It's these sort of things. I mean, if you have beer that doesn't taste weird, it affects your market. And in the end, what's all you've, what you've done is, even though it might be safe, is useless in the end, isn't it? So anyway, and the test for it for PIF is very expensive, apparently. Hundreds of dollars to do one test, because it's complicated to do. So basically, what we wanted to do with that is to try to identify what's causing the problem, which is what's leading to the weird tastes, which is presumably due to something growing that shouldn't be growing. Um, apply DNA fingerprinting methods to try to isolate it. We've had to look at a lot of samples. That's what we use. Um, Nandeep used terraful peas analysis to look at the community structure in the malt. And then next generation sequencing to try and work out what's doing it. We didn't know it was bacterial or fungi, fungal at the time, because you can get either. But in the end, we discovered it was fungal. It was some sort of yeast or other type of fungus that was growing in the, during the malt processing that resulting in the problem. And so once we worked out that, uh, we could then develop a PCR test to try and quantify the causal microbes, or the fungus, fungus in this case, and so that we could try and identify malt that's bad, essentially. So, because we're assuming that the malt is the problem, it's the storage or some other aspect that results in the malt having a community structure that's not appropriate. So you can use metagenomics, um, which is just basically community analysis and looking at all the different microbes in the particular community, using pyrosequencing. And we, used, we looked at large subunit uh, RNA genes. The databases were really, really poor at the time of the project, so it was really hard. But it's now very, very much improved, I think, in terms of this area in recent times because the area is moving so fast. So we're able to delineate community structures that were different between malts that were PYF positive and negative, basically, just to, in a nutshell, and develop a PCR test, a multiplex PCR test, to try and detect basically fungi we don't expect to be present in typical malts for that particular brewery. We would assume that perhaps maybe we might have to tailor this a little bit more if we were looking at more and more malts. But the malts that were looked at came across all, all over the world from different companies. So we're hoping that the test will be universal. So using quantitative PCR to assess the malts, and I think we've gotten basically to a stage where we can say that our PCR tests actually do um, successfully at least statistically, detect PYF. So in other words, it's detecting fungi that could be leading to the PYF problem. And then we still need to validate that using, um, against a whole range of samples, just blind, doing this blind, essentially, in order to be able to have something that we can believe is robust. Because this will be used in a commercial setting, and hopefully the test will be much cheaper and quicker than previous tests, which were very expensive and, and took days, several days to do. Okay, right. So that's one example of using omics, I guess, the sort of metagenomics or basically community analysis to try and come up with a solution to a problem. So let's move to meat safety and interventions against E. coli, where we do it, where the interventions are a bit different, or the process is a bit different, and what sort of methods we use. Now, red meat's a major export, sixteen billion dollars. So this is of course of substantial interest to many people in the country not just producers, but of course you've got producers who grow the meat, essentially, and then you've got abattoirs. And, so, and it's a significant sector in Tasmania, it's, even though it's only maybe about 1% <laughs> or something of the total. Um, so the main concerns we have is pathogenic E. coli because they're naturally, cows or cattle are a natural reservoir for E. coli, and you can get serotypes that have they can cause serious illness, inter inter hemorrhagic diseases, various sorts, 
uremic syndrome, which basically can kill you, destroy your kidneys, which is really bad. And this has happened, you know, basically elsewhere, typically. Though it's happened in Australia with, I think it was the Gary Baldy Institute, which where it was processed meats in that particular case. Um, but essentially, it's a public health problem. And if there is a sort of a, a concern that the meat is unsafe, it affects market access. So, for example, a market like China or something could say, well, we don't think Australian beef is, is, is safe. We'll just get it from, the, um, from the Argentina or somewhere like that. So there's a certain degree of comp um, uh, competition, if you like. So having meat that's sort of certified to be 100% safe, 110% safe, is an advantage. So how do you stop E. coli and meat if it's all... Because it's all over the cow, it's like on its hide, it could be in its gut. Of course, you're in an abattoir and of course you're cutting open the, the, the carcass. Um, then the chance of contamination is quite large. So there's all these different interventions like hide washing, knife trimming, hot water washing, acid washing. Um, nothing is particularly, is 100% effective because it's, just, you know, it's essentially a microscopic problem. The actual dose to get disease is like really small, like about 30 cells or something like that, or even smaller perhaps. Um, so in a sense, it's, it's all about risk, essentially. So there is always a desire to try and have a process that works really well, that's really simple and essentially cheap to, I guess, for the economics side of the for production. Because presumably, you know, if you're having $16 billion worth of beef being sent out every year, that's a lot of beef. And so, as a result, you want a process that's relatively economical. So one possible one is chilling, which has the potential to be developed as an effective intervention because we know that if you chill the carcass rapidly, it dries it out a bit. The E. coli don't like being dried. They get desiccated and it seems to inactivate them or kill them. Of course, we want to try and make it happen better effectively. We want to try to accelerate it and we want to make sure that they don't recover, they don't come back from going over the brink. So essentially we're trying to lower bacterial numbers on the carcass to the, and this includes E. coli. It also has the advantage of, of increasing the shelf life, or I would assume that it would to some extent, but I'm not truly sure how that's been quantified, if that's ever been looked at, if it does actually extend the shelf life. But we're, we're actually doing some work on that, and I'll show that later, that's right. Okay. Right, so we're working with MLA, Meat and Livestock Australia, to develop interventions. That's what Jay and Bianca are doing in their project with Tom Ross. Um, and that would develop an effective, reliable, and cost-effective, which is the other aspect, method for the industry. Now, one of the things we know is that E. coli is inactivated by chilling over time. Um, however, it's able to recover, even though it, there's, growth is not possible. So presumably this would be happening in the situation where there's no actual nutrients. So presumably what's happening is that the organism is not really dead. It's actually, at least part of the population is still viable. So there's this concept of viable but not culturable. But even that's sort of a transient sort of thing. You can see this in other bacteria like Vibrio is a classic one that behaves like this as well. You give it a cold shock, it becomes, it sort of seems to die but it can come back to life. Now Jay in his PhD looked at this in great detail and did lots and lots and lots of work. And, and also with co uh, colleagues in CSIRO, Thea King and Carrie Gobius. Um, and basically looked at this and this whole process, which is quite interesting, and it's really an intricate examination of what happens to microorganisms when they're stressed, essentially, by non-thermal stress, is that you grow the organism and then give it the chill stress, you can see that its population declines, or its viable population declines. But then it recovers right, quite rapidly, and it's, it's recovering more rapidly than you'd expect. And then eventually it starts growing again if it's got nutrients, presumably. So if it's not given nutrients, of course, it probably would just stay flat. So what the objective is to try and make this process faster and stay and not have recovery. 
so that the E. coli disappear. I mean, well, essentially they become a non-risk. A non so to actually try to understand this, we used a number of omics methods to try to unravel what was the mechanistic basis of this process, essentially. And it's quite complicated. I mean, we're sort of limited by what we already know about E. coli. The e. coli is the model organism for micro microbiology. It's the primary species in which almost all our molecular genetics data is based upon. So you can go to a, a website called EcoPsych and you get a whole raft of information about every gene present in the organism that's known. So we're sort of reliant on that. So it's good that we were working with E. coli because if we'd working on another species, we probably would have a lot more of a work to do in trying to understand what it was actually involved. So, so we looked at both transcriptomics using microarray. This is done CSIRO. And we, we did proteomics here with, at CSL with Richard Wilson. And I think that was really good work. It's been published, if you're interested in it. And I can give you copies of the papers. Um, or Tom could. Um, and we could actually essentially try to understand what was going on in this process of inactivation and recovery. And then the subsequent outgrowth from that. And it, things aren't straightforward. Things don't just get turned on and off. Things get turned off at different rates, at different, in different patterns. Some are linear, some are sigmoidal, and it's very complicated. Lots of statistics are needed, and a lot of, I think you have to have a fairly good knowledge of physiology to try and make sense of it all. But in the end, one clear thing was obvious, is that during the injury phase, there was an oxidative stress response that was suppressed. So the various genes which turn on proteins, or actually code for proteins involved with oxidative stress management, so your catalases, your peroxidases, your superoxide dismutases, things like this, um, per per peroxyredoxins and so forth, tended to be suppressed, turned off. So the organism becomes essentially vulnerable to forms of oxidative stress. And that was the main result that came out of that, an actual thing that could be exploited. So from that work, we can understand how E. coli behaves, and then what it might be more susceptible to, vulnerability that was elicited by this work, and then application-based research to try and exploit this. So for example, this is where Bianca comes in. She's using chlorine, chlorine dioxide as an oxidizing reagent, simply because it's very easy to use. And it's, I think it's generally, I think the whole concept is that it's an acceptable compound. And you know, it's already probably used widely in industry as a, as a disinfectant. And that's something that we could apply in a chill, chill stressed and, um, type sort of application, which would involve spraying, or air chilling and so forth, spraying and water in the abattoir itself in an industrial price scale process, which is really what it has to be turned into. So Bianca's been doing this work the last year or so. And just to show some results, we can see more rapid killing with the chlorine, or reasonably rapid killing with the chloride dioxide. And that's no treatment. Now we find that I think if you chill the organisms or the E. coli, um, the sooner you do, you so the actual timing of the application is critical because if you chill them longer, they have a, t a chance to actually activate other genes, which basically reverses their oxidative stress management sensitivity. So it's possible that what's happening is that the chilling just slows that down, but eventually they respond. It's not like they turn it off permanently. So the timing is very crucial. So these are the sort of things that we have to develop um, to make the, or understand in order to make this uh, approach feasible at a bigger scale, which is what's being done at the moment. So Bianca's been spraying meat, hanging up in incubators in the lab and, and painting E. coli on them, basically, and spraying them and so forth. And they're going to the abattoir to actually to take this to the next level. So doing an actually in situ abattoir type work on bigger pieces of meat, um, maybe not entire carcass. I can't imagine. I could just visage Bianca painting with a huge brush of carcass stones. So and then spraying it with a, with a hose. Um, probably not. But in the end, what we're trying to do is trying to see if it actually will work and it's feasible. 
because this is what has to be done. And it may require some clever thinking to get it to work um, at the level that we want to. Okay. We're also interested in meat quality because this is the other side of the spectrum. You know, it's no good at sending meat that might be safe, but it spoils quickly and of course you know, no one's going to buy it you know, or eat it. So one of the nice things about Australian beef, I don't know if it's special, but presume this is what I've heard, is that it has a shelf life of 30 weeks when it's vacuum packed at minus one degrees or thereabouts. And Mandeep and Michelle Williams have been doing a lot of work on looking at this. So there's lots and lots of experiments. Again, it's, this is funded by MLA. Modelling the growth on meat from abattoirs, looking at microbial interactions. This is work that Pepe is doing, Pepe Zone. Um, microbial communities and the link to spoilage. And then also rapidly assessing, maybe rapid assessment of the spoilage in the end, once we have a good knowledge of what do we want to look for. So, and this is where the metabolomics come in, using various different methods to try and understand this part, to try and eventually develop something that's practical. But we're at very early stage. We barely know anything. I think we're complete neophytes when it comes to metabolomics. And I think even people at CSL are only learning too, in a way. So I think this is really, um, is, has a lot of possibilities. Really nice area to do research into. And if you look at the literature, it's exploding in terms of this field, this particular field. So it's like chemical, chemistry um, based or analytical chemistry based applications but to biology and that, that can be then taken to practical outcomes. I think this is a very exciting area. So we look at NMR, so we have this very expensive piece of equipment in CSL, um, it's been run by James Horn there, he's the expert on NMR and theoretically we could use NMR to develop maybe targets, target metabolites to looking at spoilage or other aspects, even potentially safety if it's sensitive enough, probably, that's probably a bit hopeful. But, and there's other methods that we can probably use too, like um, using hybrid mass, mass spectrometry to do absolute quantification of metabolites. Okay, so that's enough with meat. And that's a project that's going on for 2016, so hopefully we'll make big headway for that and get some international profile. Now we go to salmon. Salmon's the biggest agribusiness in Tas. Half, half $500 million and it's growing very fast. Approximately 20% a year apparently, from what I understand, in terms of its value. And it's an active expansion. So Macquarie Harbour is, for example, a new site for salmon farms. Even though Tasmania, even though it's one of the it's a significant production area, it's only 1.5% of the world's production. So Norway, for example, Faroe Islands are huge in this area. So, however, most of the production that we have in, in Tasmania goes to only customers in Australia and New Zealand. It doesn't go any further. And this possibly is due to shelf life issues, which Shane Powers worked on, who's in the audience. I think it's about two or three weeks maximum. Is that correct, Shane? Yeah, that's a huge shelf life. I like 30 weeks for beef. Now, if you can make salmon have a shelf life of 30 weeks, now that would mean, consider, especially if you, you kept it to yourself, like you know, the industry, that would be a huge market advantage, wouldn't it? Anyway, but I might be fantasising. Now, the industry does have sustainability issues with climate change and economics. So, for example, water temperature increase affects the industry because the salmon have physiological limitations. They are most comfortable at 14 degrees, but above about 18 degrees, they really start to suffer stress. And this leads to reduced productivity in the industry. Also, there's a problem with feed ingredient costs, like fish oil and fish meal. As you can see, the price there on the, on the right-hand side is going up and up and up and up, and the same thing applies to fish oil. In fact, interestingly, fish oil pretty much correlates directly with crude oil costs for whatever reason. Maybe people don't on the markets, commodity markets don't see a difference between oil sources, but it's about the same rate. But you can sort of see the temperature differences here. And this is a worry potentially though. Um, we're actually in a period of very mild summers. So it's been good for the industry, but as I said, it might be mild now, but in two years time it might not be. And they might have a whole host of problems. 
and come knocking on my door, maybe, who can say. Right. However, we've found that there's links apparent but not understood between salmon gastrointestinal tract microbial community um, in relationship to diet, seasonal changes in the water temperature and salmon farm management. So in other words, what we're trying to say here is that the microbes that live in salmon somehow play a role in the productivity of the salmon, the growth of the salmon, which is what the industry wants. They want the, the industry basically, all it cares about is how much salmon they make from their farms. Literally, that's, it's all based on weight. So if they have feeding the fish and in summer the salmon are growing very poorly and they're giving them lots and lots of food but they're not actually growing, it's a waste of money, isn't it? And as a result, this is, we believe that this is connected with microbiological issues since if you antimicrobially treat the salmon, they actually grow faster during summer. However, of course, people don't want to use antibiotics because, of course, it's not very... It usually gets bad press. So, but no one really knows anything about the microbes in salmon. So, and that's already... We still don't know very much, even with all the stuff that we've done. But we're getting there, hopefully. Um, we'll get there in some way. So we've done a number of experiments. We've done a farm production service. This is work done by Cameral Sakasi and people at University of Sunshine Coast. I also supervise two students there, Christina Newman and Eva Hatchi, um, working with Hamid Fatuli there and University of Sunshine Coast in Maroochydore. And we did diet trials and we also have an in situ gut lab scale model. And this is very similar to the sort of experiments that have been happening in humans. Um, you know, the whole concept of the microbiome and the manipulating or understanding the microbiome, how it works, it relates to human disease. So, for example, Kevin is going off to a postdoc at the University of California in Los Angeles to look at the skin microbiome, so, which is, has its own set of species. The gut has a, a different set. And, but we don't really understand how they connect to human health. There's a lot of excitement in this area, and people came up with some results initially saying, well, if people who are obese have this different community, but as soon as people started looking harder, they found there was no patterns at all. There was a lot of initial excitement, but it was too, let's just say, a bit unbridled, the cowboy. I mentioned in the previous slide, you know, the farmer, the miner and the cowboy. Well, that was cowboy-type science. You don't really understand, you know, so this is the part that we're trying to do at the moment. So for, what you have to do for this sort of, you have to collect lots of faecal samples, rather unpleasant, you squeeze the fish, well it's not that bad actually. Um, and we have to get lots and lots of samples because each little fish is a little bit different to each other, even though there's 70,000 in a pen, they're not all the same. That's what we've discovered, which to my slight horror, that you can get a lot of diversity within a population, even though they all sort of look the same, they're not all the same. I think that the same applies to humans too. We're all a little bit different. So this makes it a bit more complicated. And you get complex microbial communities. So we can use simple methods like heat maps to try and make sense of them. But even then it's like, well, that's what we see. What does it mean? You know, it changes over time. This is, this is a, a time course. And the, the, level, the actual colour indicates abundance or relative abundance. So the red means more abundant, green means less abundant. And you can see it's highly dynamic and changes over time, but we don't understand if this change is something we would see all the time or only some of the time. Does it vary with different conditions? It's what organisms are changing. But it's sort of something that has to be repeated and looked at many times to be able to actually say what's going on. So you do statistical methods to try to compare these communities. And Ceaselessly dynamic is what we discovered through microbial communities in salmon. Unlike humans, where our communities in our gut tend to be relatively stable by comparison. So you have to disturb them with substantial effort, like antibiotic treatment, for example, um, before you can actually see a, a major change. But fish have an open gut system, so they're constantly getting colonised by outside microbes. So you can see the change here, the beginning of survey and end of survey, it doesn't go back. This is a seasonal cycle over from winter to summer to winter, but we end up with different community at the, at the end. So there's so many complications to doing this type of work. And so the other problem is just trying to link 
our data to farm level data, which is the current problem. So we can see differences between diets, so we just don't need to know the name of these diets, they're just different diets. And you can see that they're, they're different. This is statistical analysis, and this basically just says the blue um, triangles are different to the pink dots, it's a different diet, you're a different microbial community. It's dynamic in time as well, not just the diet is different, it's also changing over time in a different way. So how do you relate that to the farm level data, which is in this case shows the result of the fish themselves. It's, there's so many elements that are needed. So we have to use other omic technologies to look at fish physiology, for example, like transcriptomics and who knows what else, to actually understand what the fish are doing, not just the microbes. So we have to do experiments with both fish and salmon together. That's the only way we're going to do this, I think, successfully and make sense of it. So this is my last slide. Um, possibilities and challenges. So we have new analytical technologies and methods that allow for richer and greater depth of information. I'll just give an example of such. Did you know at the end of the 2014 there will be 230,000 human genomes sequenced? 230,000 genomes for humans. So, and I think the cost has dra dropped to about a few, th well it's about eight or nine thousand dollars, but it probably might be a thousand dollars within a, b before the end of this year perhaps. And that's what people have been saying. In fact, I think Macrogen had a sale for a thousand dollar genome for a human. I was contemplating sending my own DNA, but I didn't know how to get it out. I don't know. <laughs> so I sent them a blood sample. I was going to ask them, how do you get, <laughs> do you want a mouth swab? I don't know. I was just curious. I wanted to see what my, human, the, my genome was, but of course it's just egotistical. But there's Moore's law is the computing of aspects. Is that it's the, I think that's to do with the capacity of computers to handle information and, and the growth, of the ability to actually handle information, is outstripping that. So there's an, a gap even in the technology in handling the information. And then beyond that, you've got challenges in developing experiments that actually yield data that's actually useful. So that's where we have to be clever and innovative. I think that's where the omics, we have to really be clever and innovative. We can't just generate data and hope it means something. And then we have to understand it. And then we have, to, and the bioinformatics, which is this other big area, I find rather frustrating because a lot of it's just, oh, I've got a program that will help you analyse this very little specific type of information and it'll sort it out for you. But often it doesn't provide you with any useful clarity. Like it's just a way to organise information. And so um, I think there's so much that has to be learnt there or that has to be developed there, particularly in our university. It's, it's sort of something that we don't really, haven't really done so much of, but we're doing, I think every year it's more. And we also have to try to keep to some sort of cutting edge since the omics arena is a huge field and it's driven mainly by the medical research and it's constantly advancing and it's constantly becoming more sophisticated. So in other words, you see new stuff that you don't say, wow, I'd love to be able to do that if I had the money, but then, you know, we have to be realistic. Anyway, I hope people found the talk interesting. Any questions?